Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, let's get started. So today we are going to cover a new chapter about how to do training on the device, right? So we've discussed a lot about how to uh, train models on the cloud by data parallelism, model parallelism, gradient compression, delayed gradient aggregation, those kind of techniques ready to train the super big models. Then the next question is, can we train on the edge, right? Make it possible to train and customize the models on our edge devices. So uh, first of all, there's some logistics. Um, remember to pick up the microcontroller dev board uh, for which will be used for that four uh, during the office hour. Okay, and this is a strap duty for today. Okay, so we want to adapt to new data that is collected from the sensors, right? So we don't want to fix a particular module like a mobile app for different users, right? But we want to enable customization for different users where these AI systems need to continuously adapt to new data collected from these sensors, right? So we want to enable this intelligence. However, previously uh, we have to upload our data to the cloud to train the model, right? And then after training the cloud server can return us an updated model. So what's the drawback for that? Of course, uh, that uh, leaks has the potential to leak our personal data since we have to upload our data to the server and then get back uh, a, pre a new updated model, right? So we don't want to uh, sacrifice our privacy. Uh, so we want to enable uh, the learning locally on edge devices, which can enable better privacy, lower cost, customization, and also lifelong learning. So the smarter, but the more you use uh, this device, the smarter it gets, right? Uh, which has a lot of applications, um, such as in smart home, it can understand your habit when you get up, uh, smart manufacturing, personal healthcare, precision agriculture, right? Where there are billions of IoT devices, if we can enable customization across all these devices, that can be a good way for toward green AI and reduce the carbon footprint. So this is the lecture plan for today. Uh, we will uh, analyze um, the memory bottleneck of on demand training and introduce these efficient algorithms uh, for on demand training together with system support to realize the theoretical saving into measured speed up and, and memory saving. Okay, so let's start it. Get started with efficient on device learning algorithms to understand the training bottleneck and improve the training efficiency. We have seen this figure from um, mobile device to tiny devices. The amount of memory resource is four orders of magnitude is smaller, right? So we need to reduce both the weight and also the activations to fit those deep neural nets for on device training. So um, here is a figure showing uh, the memory footprint required for inference and also for training, okay? given the same network, which is mobile NAV2. And we can see here, um, there is a huge difference, more than 20x difference in the uh, memory, uh, memory requirement. Okay? And here we wanna pause for five, uh, a few seconds. So why training memory is much much larger than inference, where inference require only 20 megabytes, but training require 450 megabytes. What makes it so uh, memory consuming? Yeah, back propagation, you have to store all the intermediate activations. That's definitely one point. Same thing. Back propagation, yeah, exactly. During forward propagation, uh, during forward, you just need to compute one layer, throw it away. But in order to do training, you have to do back propagation. You have to store all those intermediate activations. That's one point. What's the other part? So batch size, right? For inference, especially real time inference, you can um, usually the batch size is only one, right? Streamed from the sensors. But for training, sometimes in order to make it easier to converge, we need a larger batch size, like eight or 16 or even larger, okay? So that is also another multiplier that makes 
are the training memory much larger. Okay? So this is recall of our equation given a simple um, linear layer, right? So the activation is basically the last layer's activation times the weight plus the bias, right? So to calculate the, uh, the backward, uh, in the backward phase, to calculate the gradient with respect to the weight um, is actually A transpose. Okay? You have to store those activations in order to calculate the gradient with, with, with respect to the weight, right? So that's why we need to store those intermediate activations during backpropagation. And this is actually the bottleneck for training. Okay, so inference does not need to store in any activation uh, except the, the current layer, but training does. Okay? And activations grow linearly with the batch size. If you need a batch size of eight, we have to store eight copies of that, right? right? So but for uh, inference, if you do real-time inference, that's always one. So um, usually those activations, due to the large resolution, um, say a pretty big image, the activation actually can get pretty big, especially for the first couple of stages where you have high resolution before down sampling. Okay? So that's the reason why training is more challenging than inference and causing a lot more memory than inference. So um, this is showing uh, actually the comparison of all the parameters versus the uh, activation for resin 50 versus recent methods like the modern IV tool. Um, so the number of parameters actually reduced by 4.3 times, which is pretty significant, right? But the number of activation doesn't decrease much. The main bottleneck actually doesn't improve much, only about 1.1x, almost just 10% improvement, right? So existing efficient model design methodologies focuses on inference, but the training part is neglected. Right? So the major bottleneck for training is activation. But from ResNet to MobileNet, um, the reduction is only 10%. So we should design uh, from scratch what are the, uh, the methodology, we think the methodology to design efficient models that targets training. So do you remember why um, the activation of MobileNet V2 is, doesn't improve much compared with ResNet 50? and why actually the parameters decrease a lot, but the activation doesn't. Remember the inverted bottleneck layer? So MobileNet uses this uh, type as a convolution, which basically the number of, um, um, it reduced the one dimension, right? It's just, uh, three by three by channel rather than three by three by input channel by output channel, right? So that significantly reduced the number of parameters. But the activations, due to the large expansion ratio in the inverted bottleneck, the middle layer's activation is actually quite large. So they are trading um, uh, parameters for, uh, they are trading the uh, activations for parameters, right? So in order to get a very low parameter, actually their activation is actually pretty big. So that's the issue for mobile uh, mobile mobile and inverted bottleneck. They are not training friendly. Okay. So a widely used technique, efficient um, technique for transfer learning, is just fine tune the last layer, right? Which is much simpler. Given uh, no matter how many layers you have, like resin fifty, you just fine tune the last layer, right? So that actually uh, can reduce the number of trainable parameters by a large margin. Um, by actually 13 times okay, uh, less trainable parameters. However, uh, that we used to significant accuracy degradation by just fine tuning the last layer. So this is the top line accuracy. On the CARS data set, actually you can see a, a pretty big, uh, pretty significant loss of accuracy. Okay? So it's efficient, but the, mem uh, the capacity, the learning capacity is super limited leading to very poor accuracy. <clears throat> and later people proposed, what are the other alternatives? Okay. So um, a line of work called BN plus last, just fine tune the batch normalization layer. Okay. In batch normalization layer, remember there is a scaling factor, there is a bias, right? So 
that is a pretty simple operation and doesn't have much parameters to tune, right? So and that can also lead to a very significant reduction about the number of trainable parameters, right? 12x reduction in the number of trainable parameters. And accuracy is okay. It's, it, it does suffer from, um, it, it is better than this um, fine tuning the last layer, but still it's a big um, reduction. Uh, there's a big drop compared with the fine tuning the full layer. So is this enough? Looks like we have pretty decent accuracy and pretty huge saving in the number of parameters. So is that solving our on-device transfer learning problem? Or what is the limitation by reducing the number of trainable parameters? <clears throat> exactly. It doesn't talk about the activation, right? So <clears throat> like we mentioned, uh, number of parameter is not the bottleneck, but the really bo the real bottleneck is not the number of trainable parameters, but the activations, which is the bottleneck for training. Right? So let's see what is the actual memory. Actually, only 1.8 times saving for memory. Right? So parameter efficiency does not directly translate to memory efficiency, since the memory efficiency requires two components: the activation and the parameter. Just reducing the parameter is not enough. We also have to reduce the number of activations for training. Okay, so let's see how can we do better. Also, significant loss of accuracy. Um, so uh, this research called Tiny TL, Tiny Transfer Learning, um, actually proposed another approach to fine tune the bias only. Okay, so um, W times A plus B, we only fine tune the bias which doesn't require saving any input activation during backpropagation, okay? And use this light residual learning to compensate for the uh, loss of capacity, right? And it can uh, recover the accuracy, same as before, and also bring significant reduction about uh, the total training memory, okay? So this is the key idea of tiny TL. And let's see uh, in more detail how that works. So um, this is a, a part of the mobile MV2 architecture. Okay, so um, this is the input activation. Uh, these are the weights. Okay, so we have a one by one convolution, stepwise convolution, another one by one convolution. This is the standard inverted bottleneck layer. Okay, and due to the uh, six times expansion ratio, we are expanding the number of channels from C to six C. And then here is also 6C. And after the last uh, one by one convolution, that gets reduced to C again. Right? So blue part are uh, the blue part is the activation, the yellow part is the weight. And this line is the bias, right? So um, if it's in solid color, therefore it means everything is in memory. If it is in uh, empty, then it's actually meaning either the parameters are fixed, we are not updating the parameter. Or meaning the feature map is not re uh, it does not reside in the memory. Okay, so let's see um, the equation for backpropagation and understand why bias only update doesn't require storing any activations. So this is the forward right a ai plus one equals to ai times wi plus bi. Okay, so what is the uh, partial loss over partial w? So uh, according to the chain rule, okay, so it's just AI, okay, AI times partial loss over partial W, uh, partial AI plus one, right? So uh, we have to store this activation um, in order to calculate the gradient with respect to the weight, right? But to calculate the gradient for bias, do we need to store any activations? So this is the equation calculating the loss to the bias, right? It's just according to this equation, it's the same as partial loss over partial a plus ai plus one, right? Um, so it doesn't have to uh, we doesn't have to store any uh, intermediate activations in order to calculate the bias without with respect to the weight to the bias. Okay, so that's the benefit. 
So updating weights requires storing intermediate activations, but updating the biases does not. Okay? So uh, we just want to use this simple method to update the bias, which is memory efficient. Um, and also, um, the ReLU activation function is also quite efficient. Um, since if you calculate uh, the ReLU function, this is the forward, and actually this is the backward. Okay? We just to indicate whether a location is positive or negative. Right? Just require one bit uh, to store that. So memory cost is just equal to the number of parameters. Compared to other activation functions, either sigmoid or hswish, where the back propagation is more complicated and require us to store the entire activation, right? So this is 32 times cheaper than other activation functions. So this is the, uh, this is the, the method of fine tuning the bias only, where uh, we only need to calculate the gradient with respect to the bias, but we don't have to uh, change all the parameters. That's why we have the empty um, figure for uh, these parameters. Nor do we need to store those feature maps in the memory like before, right? Since calculate the bias doesn't require storing any intermediate activation. So we can see uh, there is a drastic decrease of the training memory. But you may guess how does it hurt the accuracy? Of course, um, it can uh, significantly drop. There is a significant drop of accuracy, right? 16.3% loss of accuracy on this data set. It's better than fine tune the last layer, but still worse than uh, fine tune the batch normalization plus the last layer. Right? So how do we fix that? We can introduce a light residual branch, right? So imagine the main branch can learn something. We are just fine tuning the bias, um, but there is limited capacity, right? So we just introduce a very light weighted branch called light residual branch okay, um, to learn those new uh, new knowledge right so the new knowledge is actually incremental which doesn't require a huge amount of capacity so here we are just using a, a lower resolution which is actually half the resolution compared with the main branch in this light residual learning branch okay so the key principle is to keep the activation size small so what are the dimensions of the activation size there's a resolution times resolution times the channels, right? So we want to have lower resolution, which is actually half the resolution. And here, rather than um, this inverted bottleneck where we are expanding the number of channels by six, here we are not expanding the channels at all. So it's still a C and half the resolution. Um, so rather than using depth-wise convolution, here we use a group convolution to give more capacity, okay, more parameters without increasing the number of activations, right? So depth-wise convolution is one extreme. It is super parameter efficient by using depth-wise convolution, but in order to compensate for the capacity, it, it requires a pretty big activation, right? Six times C, but using group-wise convolution, that's a better trade-off, okay? It has more parameters, but less activations. Okay, so uh, this is the method to keep the activations small by reducing the resolution by half and also avoid this inverted bottleneck um, in the light residual learning branch. So it's, it has one sixth the number of channels compared with um, the inverted bottleneck in mobile IV2 and half the resolution, two thirds of the depth. Okay, so previously it has three layers, uh, one by one, and then the depth wise conf, another one by one. Now we have only one group conf followed by a one by one. Okay? So previously, um, they have three activations to, as intermediate feature maps. Now we have only two intermediate feature maps. So those are the design considerations. When you are designing a model from scratch, the architecture from scratch, that is fine tuning uh, friendly. Okay? So again, Conventional models like MobileNet versus ResNet, they are designed for inference efficiency. So these are the principles uh, for training efficiency, fine tuning efficiency. Okay. So now we can uh, recover the accuracy by a large margin okay, compared with both 
fine tuning uh, the batch norm versus fine tuning the bias only. Okay, any questions for bias only update and also the light residual learning? Make sure. Okay, good. We are on the same page. Ah, uh, question. The bias plus last, does that also include the batch norm? No, it doesn't uh, include the batch norm. Where the advantage is that you can actually fold the batch norm into the uh, count layer. For inference, but that's a very good question. By, uh, batch norm is um, folding is very popular for edge device. All right, and then let's see uh, another problem for transfer learning. Right, so previously we are doing image net pre-training, and this is the accuracy on image net across different model architectures. Uh, this one is Mobile V2 followed by ResNet 34. MNASNet, and this is proxy NAS. We have learned MobileNet v3, even better. And then this is ResNet 50, pretty large, pretty accurate. And then ResNet 101, even larger, uh, 2x deeper. And then in Inception v3, okay, the high, which has the highest accuracy on ImageNet. So a natural question is if a model performs well on ImageNet, like this yellow Inception v3, does it perform equally well on different downstream tasks? I'll give you one, one second to see the relative accuracy across cars, uh, classifying flowers, classifying aircrafts. Actually, a model perform on ImageNet well doesn't perform well on other downstream tasks. For example, this Inception V3 actually performs very poor on the flowers data set. However, um, uh, models like the mobile v2 um, which is this one actually perform really well on flowers and also really well on cars which are much simpler than this like a thousand class classification right so some easier data sets you may not need that large capacity like uh, resident, resident 101 resident 50 right but smaller data set a small ta a small capacity like mobile v2 might be enough Okay, so this is basically saying um, the relative order between different pre-trained models um, can change actually significantly on different downstream tasks, okay? uh, which motivates us for this kind of personalized okay, and specialized different neural network architecture for different downstream tasks. That is very expensive to train different size of models right, for different tasks. Then we'll do what have we learned, the technique that can simultaneously generate big models, small models during only require only one training time. The once for all technique, right? So uh, we can use the once for all technique to train the supernet that can contain many different subnets that can operate independently without interfering with each other. So therefore, we can generate a larger subnet for a more complicated, complicated or more difficult data set, have more images, more difficult. Okay? And then we can apply a smaller subnetwork for an easier data set with a smaller number of images. Right? So we can customize the task with different models by training only once. Okay? So this once for all technique can not only fit different hardware constraints, a full battery scenario, low battery scenario, a new phone, an old phone using larger model, smaller model, but also it can fit different tasks, challenging tasks, easier tasks, just share the model with the one phone network. So in this way, we can create specialized models for different data sets. Okay, so let's see the saving from this tiny TL, tiny transfer learning technique. So across different data sets, one is the flowers, cars, and food. Okay, so for example, on the flowers, uh, uh, there is about 6.5 times saving with respect to the training memory. Okay, from about 400, 300 megabytes to only uh, less than 100 megabytes. Okay, and here this is comparing 
uh, the red, red curve is fine tuning the batch normalization plus the last layer. Okay? And the, uh, the red curve is fine tuning the last layer only. And this um, uh, gray curve is fine tuning the full network. And here we are scaling the resolution to get an entire trade off curve okay? using higher resolution and smaller resolution. Okay? And we can see TinyTL significantly. Uh, outperform uh, other methods on diverse data sets, ranges from 4x to about 6x. So there are other methods that can reduce the training memory, like the activation pruning, right? We can prune some of the redundant activations. So the more we prune, the less the accuracy, right? But here, uh, TinyTL is far on the left-hand left side, okay, without losing any accuracy. Uh, it can significantly outperform these techniques, uh, uh, such as activation pruning in either Resin 50 or Mobile 92. Uh, just now, we also talked about another bottleneck, which is batch size. Right? We re usually, uh, we require a, a larger batch size rather than a single batch to make sure our model can converge, right? like batch size of 8 to 16. But we find actually we can use um, group normalization and okay? use group normalization during training so that the model can still converge even with a batch size of one, okay? uh, so that we can further reduce the memory from 300 megabytes to within 16 megabytes. So 16 megabytes makes it very easy to fit in L3 cache, to fit in SRAM, okay? um, enable deep learning training um, or fine tuning to fully uh, reside locally in the cache without going to off-chip DRAM access. Okay? So that can drastically improve uh, the efficiency and reduce the training memory. Okay, so uh, in summary, we talk about this primer, parameter efficiency versus memory efficiency. And parameter, parameter efficiency does not translate to memory efficiency. Another dimension to consider is actually the activations. Okay, so the main memory bottleneck of training is not parameter, but activations. Um, and tiny TL, tiny transfer learning, can save the activation memory by um, two ideas. One is the fine tuning the bias only, and a light residual learning. Okay? And we remember, during light residual learning, we want to target lower activation by using smaller resolution and less channel expansion ratio, actually channel expansion ratio of only one, and reduce the depth okay, so that we can use two layers using the group-wise convolution plus one by one convolution to replace the conventional like one by one, three by three, depth-wise plus one by one. Okay? So those are the design principles for efficient on device learning. Question? For uh, tiny scale, uh, is there any way like what you call performance with all the uh, parameters in the type of model plus the light of Oh, so the question is if we tune not only the light residual branch but also the original branch, whether we can even improve the accuracy. So if don't if you don't care about the efficiency, right? If you can hold all the memories, actually the light residual branch doesn't add much. It has one sixth the channels, half the resolution, then uh, that's one twenty fourth. It has three layers out of two, uh, two layers out of four, so times another two thirds. So the the, uh, the uh, overhead is actually quite low. We haven't done the experiment, but I suspect it might further improve the accuracy, given the marginal cost of the memory compared to the fine tuning the full full network. Okay, so these are all algorithm level improvements, right? So. Actually, how do we translate such algorithm improvement, such as fine-tuning the bias only, which TensorFlow PyTorch doesn't support, right? If you just want to fine-tune the bias, TensorFlow still want to, or PyTorch still want to calculate um, uh, to, to store all the activations, right? So how do we translate these algorithm improvements into uh, actual savings? So we'll talk about algorithm and system code design um, that can realize uh, this, the, the theoretical memory savings.
hey, so that uh, uh, motivates our chapter two, uh, which is co-design, uh, co-designing the system and algorithm for uh, on-device uh, training. Okay, so uh, we mentioned uh, we want to go smaller and smaller, right? So training is much more uh, expensive than inference. In the previous previous lecture, we talked about how to uh, run inference on microcontrollers. That will be part of your lab four, right? Which uh, we, are going to, we are going to start next week. So can we go even smaller for not only inference, but also training such as for uh, smaller devices, such as these microcontrollers, that has only 256 kilobytes of memory. So these are the uh, existing uh, frameworks memory consumption, like uh, TensorFlow uh, to train the, I believe this is the visual weak force model, require 652 megabytes of memory, right? So uh, PyTorch, which is optimized for cloud, require 300 megabytes. It's a small task, but there's a lot of overhead in the, in the runtime. Um, and also uh, the existing edge, uh, edge training infra, like MN from Alibaba, takes about four, 41 megabytes. That's still too much. Um, so we designed this tiny training engine, okay? So that can cut uh, the memory by 7x compared with uh, MN, only five megabytes. But that's still, this is our goal, right? Only 256 kilobytes. And then we can do this quantization aware scaling to enable int 8 quantized training. Okay? Not only quantized inference, but this is actually quantized training. Okay? All the gradients, the weights, the biases, uh, not the bias, the activations are in only uh, in, uh, eight, on, only 8 bits. Okay? That's another 2x saving in the memory. And sparse layer, sparse tensor update, right? So we don't have to update all the layers, the entire tensor but partially would be lazy okay? um, to update only partial layers and partial tensors. So this is a generalization about sparse uh, only updating the bias, right? So here we are selectively choosing what tensor to update, what not to update. So we can save another 8.8 .8 times. And finally, we can do operator reordering. You can consume the gradient immediately when it is produced to uh, reduce the um, cycle of the memory. Okay? So all together, we can squeeze the memory footprint by 2,000 times with 140, only 141 kilobytes of memory, which is actually the measured uh, memory uh, requirement. And we have a demo board for that, which is super exciting. So we can jump um, step by step to learn uh, how can we achieve uh, such a huge amount of memory saving by three techniques, actually. Quantization aware scaling, okay? So this is the quantization for training, okay? Um, sparse layer and sparse tensor update, where we don't have to update all the layers, or within a layer, we can sparsely update only partial of the channels. Finally, the tiny training engine uh, that can bring these theoretical savings into measured speed up by designing efficient uh, systems that support on-device training on diverse workload, um, including both CNNs and also transformers, and also diverse front ends, including TensorFlow, um, PyTorch, and JAX, and also diverse back ends, including microcontrollers, Raspberry Pis, uh, mobile CPUs, Snapdragon, also the DSPs, and also mobile GPUs. Okay, so let's start the journey together by first looking at this quantization aware scaling. So remember, we talk about quantization um, in, in the second, uh, third, uh, second chapter of our lecture, right? At that time, uh, at the beginning of this semester, we are talking about quantization for inference, right? We want to use in, uh, in, in eight integers to represent the weight and activations. So what is more complicated here? We not only have weights and activations, but also we have the gradient, right? Uh, so conventionally, we have this uh, quantized graph for quantization of aware training, which is using the fake quantization graph, right? So these are the weights, these are the input activations, 
uh, they are quantized integer value, but still they have a or we have FP32 uh, number in the background. And we are still using um, the fake version of the quantized number uh, in the pipeline where all the arithmetic is still performed in FP32 in quantization aware uh, training. Okay, QAT, quantization aware training. So actually, uh, we just insert this fake quantization operator in the, in the graph. Uh, so real quantization happens in edge devices, okay, where all the tensors are in either int8 for weight activation or int32 by the, for the bias and accumulator in real quantization. It saves the memory footprint, but leading to optimization difficulty, where um, all the computation graph happens in int8, right? So the convolution will have two inputs, and the output is accumulated with int32, the bias is in 32 with the scaling and, and, and can cast it back to in 32. Okay? The scaling factor is FP32, as we learned in the quantization lecture in the beginning of this course. Right? So this is what is actually being deployed on your phone on Raspberry Pi on the edge device. Right? So um, this quantization aware training happens still on, on the GPU in order to uh, fine tune a graph that is supposed to be deployed on the edge device. Okay, so this is a comparison about fake quantization versus real quantization. Okay? In fake quantization, the weights and activations are, are actually represented by a P32 number. Okay? It also has this batch normalization layer where you can tune. Um, but for real quantization, uh, all the weights and activations are only represented in, in, 30, in 8. And there's no batch norm. That's not the question. We are actually not tuning the batch normalization layer since on the edge device, there's no batch norm. It's already folded into the COM layer. So running on this quantized graph is actually making training quite difficult um, due to the mixed precisions, right? You have int8, int32, uh, p32, okay? So this int8, in 32 for accumulator and for the bias, IP32 for the scaling factor, right? And also you don't have this luxury of tuning the batch normalization layer. So naively applying int8 SGD, so category descent, will lead to more than 10% drop of the accuracy. That is too much. Um, so we try to analyze why this sort of quantized training is leading to such big performance degradation. So before uh, moving to the next slide, uh, let's brainstorm together. What makes training difficult using int8, using integer only training? What could go wrong here? Remember we have a scaling factor for the weight and for the activation. Uh, like rounding errors That's possible, yeah. yeah. The gradients are all represented in eight, eight, into eight, and the levels are very coarse grained. Rounding issue. Emma, yeah, Emily, same, same, same thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, your range of values is represented in eight, it's way smaller than the corresponding quarter point. Exactly, yeah. The representation range is during training, especially, um, actually that is more severe in the first couple of iterations, but this is about fine tuning. Um, that's still a problem where the range is, dynamic range matters, but not as much as during uh, training from scratch, but that's another possible reason. Actually, there is a very simple, mathematically simple, simple but long ignored issue um, during quantized training which we are going to see here. So we try to see what exactly is happening here, why there's a big difference. Therefore, we try to plot this graph, which is weight divided by the gradient, right? Say you have a weight of 10, and the gradient is 0 0.001, then applying uh, some learning rate, then actually you are not updating anything, right? So uh, this is basically comparing what is happening 
for the ratio between weight divided by the gradient. Okay, since we are using gradient to update the weight, we hope they are the relative uh, uh, range will be relatively similar. Right? But for this comparing this FP32 versus int age training, there is actually a big gap between this ratio. Um, and anyone can tell me um, what does it mean to have a much larger ratio between the W over G? Actually, that's the other direction. We are not making any progress, not jumping. We are set our jumping uh, update is too small, right? So here, W over G is for int A is too large, right? Meaning uh, W is large, but G is super small. So this is like your weight is pretty. You have pretty big weight, right? But you have a tiny little gradient, right? That makes this weight over gradient getting much bigger than the floating point ratio. Right, so you have a huge, pretty big weight, but tiny little gradient. Then the update is quite small. You actually are not learning anything. Right? So this is our observation. And why we also have another observation for this zigzag pattern. Right? Anyone can guess why we have this zigzag pattern for different tensors. This is basically the tensor index. For one layer, we have weight and we have bias. Uh, so um, <laughs> the blue color, this one is FP32, the original uh, full precision training. And this green color is the int8, okay, the quantized training. For quantized training, first of all, we have a much larger ratio uh, for W over G, meaning W is pretty large and G is pretty small. So the ratio becomes large. So let me draw it on the whiteboard. Like we have a pretty large weight, right? But a tiny little gradient. So that makes the weight over gradient pretty pretty big. So we are not learning much. Unless we have a huge learning rate. Um, so you have say you have 10 layers, then you will have 20 tensors, uh, one for weight, one for bias for each layer. And actually, uh, you have some idea? Yeah, is it um, when we're using in eight, the going between tensors, it doesn't compensate between them, so the model compensates. And it's like W over G, so it's not such a big gap with that. When the model uh, is trained with the integer. Yeah, this is floating point, this is in eight. I think go between tensors, the magnitude, like the difference between each tensor is larger for the floating point. The difference is indeed larger, right. So right. That, like, makes it more jagged, or you get like more strain when you take the weight of the gradient. The tensors are changing more. It is changing more, and we will analyze why it is changing that more dramatic for for int 8. It's actually due to a, the scaling factor, which we are going to talk shortly. But this is indeed the case. Actually, one of them is weight, one of them is bias. And it's fluctuating between the weight and bias. And, but it's not the case for, um, for the uh, P32 version. The range difference can be actually, this is in log scale, so actually five orders of magnitude between the weight tensor and, and the Bias tensor. Activation. Activation. Yeah, the range for the precision one is larger. 
Right. Actually, the calculation of the gradient of the bias versus weight is different. The but the gradient of the weight, you have to multiply that with the transpose of the activation. So uh, the scaling factor actually lead to such a difference. So we'll look at it shortly, right? So here, um, this is a, a linear, assuming a linear layer, okay? So Wx plus B, right? So the W and X are both uh, in the eight version. So anything with a hat here means it is, is the integer value. Uh, like we learned in the lecture, we have to multiply that with a floating point scaling factor, okay? A float FT32 scaling factor S, and then we get a result, we cast it to int 8, which is the, the Y, which is the output. So um, this uh, full precision W is equal to scaling factor times uh, this integer W. So um, the question here is, uh, so this this W actually ranges from uh, 0 to 256 or uh, minus 128 to positive 127. Okay, so it scales uh, this integer value W to the uh, floating point W. To remind, remind me whether this SW is greater than 1 or smaller than 1, which we learn in the quantization section. So it's projecting, uh, it's scaling this integer value, which is from minus 128 to positive 127, back to a floating point value. Actually, smaller than one, because this one is pretty big from 128, of uh, minus 128, positive 127. This one could be a smaller weight, like 1 or 1.2 or 0 0.7, something like that. So usually this is a uh, value much larger than y, uh, actually much smaller than y, to scale this integer value back to uh, the normal range. Uh, if we calculate the gradient with respect to the weight versus the gradient with, re with respect to the uh, quantized weight, okay? so this is a relationship. So the gradient with respect to this quantized weight will be uh, the gradient with respect to the original weight times this scaling factor SW, okay? So when we are calculating the weight over gradient, the ratio between this weight versus our update, versus our gradient update, so we plug in the W hat. So W hat is actually equal to W divided by SW, okay? This is floating, floating point number. This is a scaling factor, okay? Floating point number divided by the scaling factor. That gives this W hat. So what is GW hat? Okay, so GW hat is equal to the scaling factor times the GW. Okay, so we plug in SW times GW. So actually uh, the denominator has both SW appearing twice. So actually there's a SW to the power of minus two times the original W over G. Okay, so the quantized weight over gradient um, is SW uh, to the power of minus 2 times the original W over G, okay? Just now we discussed SW minus, uh, SW, this scaling factor, is something much smaller than Y, okay? So this is much larger than Y, okay? So that's why the new W over G is much larger than the original W over G compared with the floating point value, floating point version versus the quantized version. So much larger than the original value, meaning that we are having a super small update compared with the original weight. So and everyone get the idea why um, why there is a big ratio, right? So this is the quantized, this is the floating point, this W over we are calculating W over G due to this scaling factor. Um, we have a much larger uh, SW to the power of minus two. Um, so therefore, we need to rescale this ratio back to the normal value. Okay, so we rescale the gradient by this SW minus to the power of minus two. Okay, so that's the new uh, gradient. Since SW is um, so, is this one larger or the original GW larger? To test your understanding of of these equations. Is GW hat larger 
or the re rescaled speed of the hash larger. Yes, the rescaled one is larger, right? So that we no longer have such a small gradient, but we want to rescale it to make it larger, right? So that uh, the update, updated gradient, is comparable to the demand, uh, to the absolute value of the original uh, weight. And similar for the uh, for the bias, it suffer from uh, two two terms. Okay? One is the scaling factor of the W. The other is the scaling factor of the X. Right. So uh, that's why we have this zigzag pattern. It suffer from two um, two terms. Well, this one suffer from only one term. Okay. And we put them together. We denote it as S. Okay, so uh, we have this correction term. We want to amplify the GW by SW to the power of minus two, and also amplify this uh, GB to be uh, GB uh, times S to the power of minus two. Now we can align the scale of the weight over gradient to match the original floating point version. And you see this orange, gra orange line versus this blue line, um, which actually matches pretty well. Between this int uh, between this FT32 versus in int eight plus quantization aware scaling, and the most amazing part is that we don't require any hyperparameter tuning. So this scaling factor is exactly the scaling factor that we used during um, uh, during the quantization. So we know that value is a constant, right? And also we know um, there is no hyperparameter tuning. Which can make the training much more, uh, e um, much more easy, much easier. So now we can compare the accuracy with the full FP32 SGD. Compared with previously, we lose accuracy after using int eight quantization for training, but now we can fully recover the accuracy using quantization aware scaling. Compared with other methods like Adam, or we may, you may have have used this Adam uh, update function, but that require extra memory, actually three extra memory, since we have to store those states. And also the large method layer-wise adaptive learning rate, actually they both have uh, worse accuracy. So this is actually um, the uh, training loss and also the validation uh, validation loss. Uh, this is without quantization aware scaling, it starts to plateau. Uh, while with quantization aware scaling, we can continue lowering the uh, learning uh, the training loss as well as the validation loss. So very simple technique. The mathematical derivation is pretty pretty long, but the the conclusion is super simple. It's just maybe two lines of code. Um, just plug in this uh, multiply this SW to the power of two, uh, which is a value larger than one, and multiply that with your gradient. Maybe just one line one line of code actually. And can significantly reduce um, the uh, training loss, inference loss, and improve the accuracy. All right, let's continue our discussion about um, sparse layer and sparse tensor update. So we've talked about the sparsity in for inference, but uh, there is actually a, a, the technique also applies to training. Um, according to the uh, study from Nature by Peter Hattenlacher, actually. A newborn child versus a two uh, has an uh, increasing amount of synapses per, synapses per neuron as a child uh, grows from zero years old to two to four years old. Um, the number of synapses surges from um, 2,500 synapses per neuron to 15,000 synapses per neuron. Um, but as the child enters its uh, K-12 education until adolescence, the number of synapses are actually getting sparse, decrease from uh, 15,000 synapses per neuron to only 7,000 synapses to, per neuron, right? So uh, meaning that as we are, this is actually the time where we are learning most of the knowledge in our lifetime, learning new stuff in our lifetime, until uh, uh, he, got, he or she gets to, uh, to adult, uh, the synapses per neuron is becoming fixed, right? About 7,000 synapses per neuron. So uh, as an analogy, this is probably the uh, um, uh, pre-training step. This is probably the fine-tuning step. So actually, during fine-tuning, we are not utilizing 
all the synapses, right? But actually, we are actually sparsely updating um, the synapses in the brain using this sparse learning technique. And does that also learn uh, apply to artificial neural nets? So this is the full learning scheme, right? So during forward, during backward, we are actually updating all the layers and all the biases. Okay, so here, uh, this rectangle is the weight, and this rectangle is the uh, is the bias. Okay, so updating the whole model is pretty pretty uh, pre, uh, pretty expensive. Like we mentioned, we have to store all the intermediate activations, uh, which uh, have to store the intermediate activation, which is pretty large, and also we have to store the updated weights in the SRAM because flash is read only. And this is the comparison of uh, fine tuning only the last layer, which degrees the accuracy. And this is the figure of showing updating the bias only, right? So actually, we have a new um, scheme. We can uh, sparsely choose which layer to update. And even for a certain layer that is updated, we can sparsely choose a portion of them to be updated. So this is sparse tensor back propagation, and this is sparse layer back propagation. Okay? And the back propagation stops here so that we don't need to store anything uh, ahead of it. Uh, this is another visualization about these three techniques. A full update, you update both the weight and also the activation. Uh, this is the bias only update. We only update the bias versus sparse layer update. Among the two layers, we only update that layer. Versus a sparse tensor update, we update tensor partially. Okay. What is the benefit of sparse tensor update? So compared with the full update, where uh, dy dw equal to the, uh, um, the gradient with respect to the activation transpose times the original uh, x. Right. So here, um, we have to store the entire activation n times m in the memory, and weight in SRAM is actually uh, M times H. But if we only uh, do partial weight update, okay, so we only have to store partial of the activations. So uh, here we are so, uh, saving uh, three quarters and need to, only, need to only store one quarter of the activation. So this is the big picture, comparing the full update Versus this is the bias only update, versus this is the uh, sorry this is the uh, fine tuning the last layer only, and this is the bias only update. Okay, versus the proposed sparse layer and the sparse tensor update. So we are selectively choosing certain layers to update, and we are soon going to talk about how to automatically choose that, and also how to uh, selectively choose a sub tensor to update. Okay, so this here comes the question, what to update? So here, actually, we need to think about that from two perspectives. Okay? One is the accuracy perspective. What is the contribution of this layer to the accuracy? And the other is the system's perspective. What is the overhead? What is the size of the activation, the size of the uh, weight we have, to, uh, we have to store if we decide to update this layer, right? So let's start first. Uh, discuss it from the system perspective and then from the accuracy perspective. So from this layer, we are showing the um, uh, activation size across different layers in yellow. Okay? This is the activation size versus the size of the weight in blue. So what you can observe here. So um, the yellow curve is actually getting pretty large in the beginning and pretty small in the later stage. And for the weight, it's actually pretty big in the later stage and pretty small in the beginning. So this is forming a U-shaped curve. And a quick question here, um, why the activation and the weight is forming such a U-shaped structure? One is larger in the beginning, one is larger in the end. Why that happens? 
Yes, exactly. That's a really good point. So uh, in the first couple of layers, we have no down sample. So the resolution is pretty huge. Uh, that's why the activation is pretty large. Okay? The resolution is big. But later we have down sample, so even um, there is more channels, but the resolution shrinks uh, quadratically with the number of res uh, pixels, so that's making it smaller. But for the uh, weight memory, okay, you have three by three kernel times number of kernels times the channel number, right? So here we have more channels in the end, that's why we have more um, uh, storage required for the weight. So uh, intuitively, something in the middle is a sweet spot, right? We need to update fewer number of parameters, and also, and also we don't need to store a lot of um, activations. So, um, so we choose to select to select those those layers in the middle to update, uh, together with partially updating those later layers. Okay, so this breaks the conventional wisdom that we just fine-tune the uh, last layer, okay? And we find actually those middle layers are pretty cost-efficient to fine-tune because they neither have pretty big activation nor do they have pretty big weight, okay? So in the middle, both the weight and activation is relatively small. Then the cost of fine-tuning those layers are not that big, okay? So uh, this is showing uh, we, uh, we are fine-tuning uh, a quarter of this layer, one-eighth of this layer, and 100% and, and for these four layers. Okay? So across all these layers, we are just fine-tuning uh, these six layers. And for the bias, we update everything until, until here. Okay? So uh, this is from the system's perspective. What is the cost? of updating the activation versus the weight. And the conclusion is that those middle layers are really cost efficient to tune for CN models. And also uh, appearing in the same conference uh, in New York, uh, Professor Charles E. Finn from Stanford is also having a similar observation that uh, is advocating for fine tuning those middle layers. So if you're interested, feel free to check them out for New Rips 20. 22, similar for, same for this paper. Okay, so let's now talk about the other perspective, which is from the accuracy perspective. How much contribution, okay, does each, each layer contribute to the overall accuracy? So um, this is first talking about the bias. So um, we try to investigate the contribution of the last K biases to see when should we stop, right? And we we observe that um, the uh, accuracy gain actually is getting plateaued as we fine tune about twenty five layers. Okay, so fine tuning more biases doesn't contribute much, right? So previously we were talking about just fine tune all the biases, and here after we do this study we find actually that's not quite necessary, right? We can only uh, fine tune about like 25 layers and then we can stop. So this is the method that we can automatically choose which layer to tune for the bias. And this figure is showing uh, which layer should we update the weight and how much should we update. Are we updating the full tensor or one quarter or half or only one eighth? So this is called contribution analysis where we only fine tune one particular layer, say only layer 25, and see how much accuracy gain can we get. For example, uh, layer uh, layer 4. Actually, let fine tuning layer 4 is leading to about minus 3% minus three of accuracy improvement, meaning that fine tuning those early layers actually hurts the accuracy. Anyone can guess why? Fine tuning the layer, early layer actually hurt the accuracy. Lower resolution features, larger reception. 
Yeah. Right, right. Those low level uh, early layers are actually learning those low level features, which shouldn't be changed. But if you fine tune those layers, actually, it hurts the accuracy. And the more you update, the worse the accuracy. If you update all the channels, the accuracy is significantly worse. But if you only update one eighth of the channels, uh, the, the impact is smaller. Right? It's showing that for this region, we shouldn't update them at all. Right? But for those later layers, we find the contribution is getting bigger and bigger, especially the last layer, um, the last block. The contribution is the biggest, right? Um, and also, what are the other findings? It also forms this zigzag pattern, right? So actually, that corresponds to the inverted bottleneck, which has pointwise, depthwise, pointwise. And for these three layers, um, this is pointwise, depthwise, pointwise. And the contribution of the pointwise one is actually the largest. So pointwise one, depthwise pointwise two. And similarly, pointwise one, depthwise pointwise two. Okay? So the first the pointwise layer consistently have larger contribution than uh, the second pointwise and the depthwise layer. This actually also a very good phenomenon from the systems perspective. So the pointwise point wise one layer. Uh, the number of input channel is six times smaller than the second pointwise layer, and also it's smaller than the depthwise layer. Since th this inverted bottleneck has smaller input channel, big intermediate channel, smaller input uh, output channel. Okay, so it's very cheap. It's relatively cheaper to update the first the depthwise layer because the number of input channels are much smaller. Um, so the first pointwise convolution is contributing more to the overall accuracy compared with the depthwise, compared with the second pointwise. So that's from the accuracy perspective. From the system perspective, it's also cheaper from the memory perspective to update the first pointwise compared with depthwise and pointwise, since this activation is smaller than this one and smaller than this one. So that's a good observation. We want to update the first pointwise layer in the inverted bottleneck. And the third observation is that updating full layer is better than half, better than a quarter, better than one eighth, right? So here, uh, that is actually corresponding to our intuition. So uh, given these observations, we need to make three decisions. So first of all, um, which uh, bias do we update? And which weight do we update? If we update it, do we update uh, all the channels or half or one quarter or eighth of the channels? Right? Um, so here we are using an automated approach to uh, decide uh, which one of them to update. Okay? So given um, the constraint, we want to figure out uh, which k layers do we update the bias? And which I layer do we update the weight? And what is the ratio um, of all the tensor we updated that? Okay. So we are doing this contribution analysis to see each layer's contribution if we tune them versus not tuning them. Okay. So this is the contribution from the bias, and this is the contribution from um, updating the weight. Okay. So we want to maximize um, uh, the total uh, contribution, assuming uh, each component uh, can functionally independently, but actually that's only approximation given a memory constraint. Okay? Of course, updating more, for example, updating all the weights will lead to a better accuracy, but that might sacrifice, that might broke, uh, break our uh, memory constraint. So under the same memory constraint, what is the maximum of the total contribution for the bias and also for the weight? And that is our goal. So using this method, we can automatically figure out what is the contribution for each bias, each weight, and each proportion of the weight, okay, so that we can update them correspondingly. So here are the results for different models. So 
uh, MZUNet, five frames per second, uh, Mobile MV2, and Proxy NAS, right? So we are comparing several baselines. Um, one is um, updating the last K layers, okay? So if K equal to uh, all, the, all the layers, actually that's full model update. And we actually find that the upper bound of updating the last K layer is even higher than if the K equal to N, N is the number of layers, indicating that updating all the layers is not optimal, but um, updating um, some of the K layers is actually even better than updating all the layers. Uh, similar observation happens for mobile NV2 and also the proxy NAS. The upper bound is not actually updating the full model. And um, the yellow curve is updating the last bias only. You can see the required memory is much smaller, okay? much smaller for updating the bias. Uh, last K bias is only, but the accuracy is also significantly lower, 70 versus 74. Okay? Uh, this is 64 versus 70. Right? Um, and here is the sparse update. You, Across these three dimensions, you want to select which bias to update, which weight to update, and what is the proportion within the tensor to update that weight. Okay? And we can um, achieve a higher accuracy with 4.5 times, 7.5 times, and 7.1 times smaller measured uh, memory um, requirement. So, um, is everyone? Clear? Okay, question here. Well, what is our regular requirement for us? Like, uh, is there like a training network that has validation data sets and we don't leave training data sets? So in this case, do we have like a requirement training data set blank that we use to use to batch what our tensors we're updating, but we're testing it while retraining a different requirement data set? Yeah, of course. Actually, uh, this is measure. This is actually the measured accuracy on multiple data sets. It's not only three more tests, but the test data set is many test data sets. There's cars, flowers, um, and many different different data sets. And we're averaging the accuracy to test the final performance. So that is rigorous. Yeah, so when it's deciding which tensor to match, they don't they in it of different data sets. Yeah, that's the idea, right? You want to uh, choose on a different data set than, rather than using the same data set, selecting the hyperparameter versus applying the hyperparameter. Yeah, so that's why here we are averaging and testing multiple data sets to see the average performance. Uh, can you explain to me what each data point is on the graph? Oh, okay. So um, here, each data point is scaling um, the resolution so that we can have um, different, uh, scaling the model size and the resolution to have different trade-off, right? So for example here, this is updating the last K layers. This is updating the most number of um, K layers, smaller number of K, even smaller number of K. So the memory is gradually reduced, okay? So this is one single dimension you can tune by updating less and less number of layers. So we can have less memory and also uh, lower accuracy. Uh, for this one, uh, this is sparsely updating the layers. Um, more layers, smaller number of layers, even smaller number of layers. Versus this is the last K biases, larger K, smaller K, etc. So how come when you like for the biases here, it's either kind of flat or even decreasing, but the previous slide, um, updating biases only for improvement in accuracy? So here, why? Um, actually, previous one, this is showing uh, the relative accuracy gain. You can also see some fluctuation. One layer, updating more layers, not necessarily give you higher accuracy. Sometimes there's also such such stent. Updating more layer actually give you worse accuracy by, by just one layer. But the range is not too big, right? Uh, but similar for here, they roughly fall into this between uh, roughly 70% accuracy. Okay, good.
So it's good that we completed this first two part about algorithm. Um, we'll probably leave the tiny training engine for the next lecture. So let's summarize a little bit. So we talk about several techniques for on-device training. First, we talk about this quantization aware uh, scaling so that we can train actually with int8 rather than training with IP32, right? And make it possible to converge by applying this hyperparameter free uh, scaling factor, which is coming from uh, the scaling factor for quantization for inference, right? And then we talk about this sparse layer, sparse tensor update, that not all the layers are equal. We can actually update partial layers and partial tensor within a layer or even partial biases uh, so that we can even uh, have an even better trade-off between the accuracy and the memory consumption. In the next lecture, we are going to cover the remaining part, how to realize uh, these savings from quantization and uh, sparse layer update into the measured speed up and memory saving. All right, that's the end for today's lecture. If you haven't picked up the microcontroller boards, feel free to come to us and we'll have lab four from the next week. Okay, thank you.